I just got finished sort of complaining over the fact that um, modern scientific clinical thinking, um, as well as old-fashioned religious orthodoxy, have something in common. Um, in particular, this fear of that which is unconventional. Um, revulsion, I suppose, of that which is unconventional. Revulsion at that which is unconventional. Now, that's not an entirely unfair um, reaction to a lot that you will see when you get into Tantra. Uh, in other words, it's not unfair for people to feel a little bit of revulsion, I think, because just the nature of stepping outside of what's normal, you meet all kinds of things that, I don't know, they just don't do it for you. They're just bizarre, and they evoke reactions. Um, this happens to me all the time in this very field. I delve into something, and then I hit something that just thoroughly disgusts me or puts me off the whole thing puts me off the whole thing of something that I'm seriously interested in, but it's essentially I don't want to follow that particular path. Um, as I said before, I sort of have a path before me now. I'm 50. I'm you know late in life, or I wouldn't really say this is late, but you can't you your options narrow a bit in terms of what you can actually do, and my options are narrowed to basically just harmless kind of things like um, meditating and things like that. Um, I have no desire to go any further apart from simply up here. Um, that's why I always harp on things like self-discipline. Um, tantra is one of those things that can derail you. <laughs> uh, you're constantly warned about that. You know, the old, um, you know, if you do think that this is getting a little bit too weird for you, then heed that intuition. <laughs> that's what I certainly advise people. Step back a bit and wait until you get your bearings again. Now, um, and I don't say that as an expert. I'm just saying that as an opi my opinion. Um, now, I'm going to read a passage here from somebody. Some people might have come across this. It's um, called Instructions in the Kali Yoga. Kali Yoga is you know, the vernacular, how they say it in modern North Indian languages. Uh, it's by a fellow by the name of Hakim Bey. It's not his real name. He was just a fellow, or I think he's still around, from the counterculture, the psychedelic counterculture in California in the 1960s. And it's a passage that put the hook in me quite early in life, but it still fills me with revulsion and on many levels. And it's just sort of one of those things that you have to sort of take it as a whole and make up your own mind. In advance, before I even read it, I'll say I've more or less rejected this, what I'm going to read on several levels. But the power inherent in it, if you're of a certain turn of mind, is undeniable. Um, and there's a caution here. It's written by an American who's trying to be cool. and he's in the, It's in the 1960s. Um, a somewhat pious Hindu might find all of this offensively caricaturing his or her religion or his or her faith or whatever. Um, I think that it does do that. I think that Hakim Bey is not showing respect to that which he says that he's showing respect to. Be that as it may, um, it's just you'll see the things in here that probably would disgust a person like me if you've watched my videos, but you'd also see the power in this. In particular, I object to the author's ego. Ego. Now, if somebody objects to, if somebody like me with a massive ego objects to your ego, you know you've got a problem. Um, here we go. The Kali Yoga still has 200,000 or so years to play. Good news for advocates and avatars of chaos. Bad news for Brahmins, Yahwists, bureaucrat gods, and the running dogs. I knew Darjeeling hid something for me as soon as I heard the name Dorjeling, Thunderbolt City. In 1969, I arrived just before the monsoons. Old British Hill Station, summer headquarters for government of Bengal. Streets in the form of winding wood staircases, the mall with a view of Sikkim and Mount Kachinjunga. 
Tibetan temples and refugees, beautiful yellow porcelain people called Lepchas, the real abos, Hindus, Muslims, Nepalese, and Bhutanese, Buddhists and decaying Brits who lost their way home in 47, still running musty banks and tea shops. Colorful stuff. Met Ganesh Baba, fat, white-bearded sadhu with overly impeccable Oxford accent. Never saw anyone smoke so much ganja, chillum after chillum full. Then we wander the streets while he played ball with shrieking kids or picked fights in the bazaar, chasing after terrified clerks with his umbrella, then roaring with laughter. He introduced me to Sri Kamanansaran Biswas, a tiny, wispy, middle-aged Bengali government clerk in a shabby suit who offered to teach me Tantra. Mr. Biswas lived in a tiny bungalow perched on a steep pine tree, misty hillside, where I visited him daily with pints of cheap brandy for puja and tippling. He encouraged me to smoke while we talked, since ganja too is sacred to Kali. Mr. Biswas, in his wild youth, was a member of the Bengali terrorist party, which included both Kali worshippers and heretic Muslim mystics, as well as anarchists and extreme leftists. Ganesh Baba seemed to approve of this secret past, as if it were a sign of Mr. Biswas's hidden tantrika strength, despite his outwardly seedy, mild appearance. We discussed my readings in Sir John Woodruff, Arthur Avalon. Each afternoon, I walked there through cold summer fogs, Tibetan spirit traps flapping in the soaked breeze, loomed out of the mist and cedars. We practiced the Tara Mantra and Tara Mudra, or Yoni Mudra, and studied the Tara Yantra diagram for magical purposes. Once we visited a temple in the, to the Hindu Mars, like ours, both planet and war god, where he bought a finger ring made, of, made from an iron horseshoe nail and gave it to me. More brandy and ganja. Tara, one of the forms of Kali, very similar in attributes, dwarfish, naked, forearmed with weapons, dancing on dead Shiva, necklace of skulls or severed heads, tongue dripping blood, skin a deep blue-gray, the precise color of monsoon clouds. Every day more rain, mudslides blocking roads. My border area permit expires. Mr. Biswas and I descend the slick, wet Himalayas by jeep and train down to his ancestral city, Siliguri, in the flat Bengali plains where the Ganges fingers into a sodden, viridescent delta. We visit his wife in the hospital. Last year, a flood drowned Siliguri, killing tens of thousands. Cholera broke out, the city's a wreck. Aljay stained and ruined. The hospital's halls still caked with slime, blood, vomit, the liquids of death. She sits silent on her bed, glaring unblinkingly at hideous fates. Dark side of the goddess. He gives me a colored lithograph of Tara, which miraculously floated above the water and was saved. That night we attend, some, we attend some ceremony at the local Kali temple, a modest, half-ruined, little roadside shrine. Torchlight, the only illumination. Chanting in drums with strange, almost African syncopation. Totally unclassical, primordial, and yet insanely complex. We drink. We smoke. Alone in the cemetery, next to a half-burnt corpse, I'm initiated into Tara Tantra. Next day, next day feverish and spa spaced out, I say farewell and set out for Assam, to the great, Shiva, uh, the great temple of Shakti's Yoni at Guwahati, just in time for the annual festival. Assam is forbidden territory, and I have no permit. Midnight in Guwahati, I sleep, sneak off the train, back down the tracks, through mud and through rain and mud up to my knees and in total darkness. Blunder at last into the city and find a bug-ridden hotel. Sick as a dog by this time. No sleep. In the morning, bus up to the temple and a nearby mountain. Huge pillars, pollulating deities, courtyards, outbuildings, hundreds of thousands of pilgrims. Weird sadhus down from the rice caves, squatting on tiger skins and chanting. Sheep and doves are being slaughtered by the thousands. A real hecatomb, not another white scythe in sight. Gutters running inch deep in blood. Curved bladed Kali swords, chop, 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 dead hands plucking it, dead heads, <laughs> plucking into the slippery collars, cobblestones. Stuttering here. This is kind of the offensive part. <laughs> when Shiva chopped Shakti into 53 pieces and scattered them over the whole Ganges basin, her cunt fell here. Some friendly priests speak English and help me find a cave where the yoni is on display. By this time I know I'm seriously sick, but determined to finish the ritual. I heard of pilgrims at least one head all at least one head shorter than me, 
literally engulfs me like an undertow wave at the beach and hurls me suspended down suffocating, winding, troglodyte stairs into claustrophobic womb cave where I swirl nauseated and hallucinating toward a shapeless cone meteorite smeared in centuries of ghee and ochre. The herd parts for me allows me to throw a garland of jasmine over the yoni. How's that for an image? A week later, in Kathmandu, I entered the German missionary hospital for a month with hepatitis, a small price to pay for all that knowledge, the liver of some retired colonel from a Kipling story. But I know her. I know Kali. Yes, absolutely, the archetype of all that horror. Yet for those who know, she becomes the generous mother. Later in a cave in the jungle above Rishikesh, I've been to Rishikesh, actually, I meditated on Tara for several days with m mantra, yantra, mudra, incense, and flowers, and returned to the serenity of Darjeeling, its beneficent visions. Her age must contain horrors, for most of us cannot understand her or reach beyond the necklace of skulls to the garland of, of jasmine, knowing in what sense they are the same. To go through chaos, to ride, like, to ride it like a tiger, to embrace it, even sexually, and absorb some of its shakti, its life juice. This is the path of Kali Yoga. Creative nihilism. For those who follow it, she promises enlightenment and even wealth, a share in her temporal power. The sexuality and violence serves as metaphors in a poem which acts directly on the consciousness through the image, the, the imagination, or else in the correct circumstance they can be deployed and enjoyed, imbued with a sense of the holiness of everything, from ecstasy and wine to garbage and corpses. Those who ignore her or see her out, outside themselves risk destruction. Those who worship her as Ishta Devata or Divine Self taste her age of iron as though it were gold, knowing the alchemy of her presence. Now, that's got a strong taste of Western I'm so cool guruism about it. Um, he misrepresents a few things in, in his passage. Um, you don't just walk up to a sadhu, for one thing, in India. They will not approach you. Um, that's just the one of the small things. Um, secondly, if you're going to be, get into one of those sects that involves drinking and the use of ganja, um, long period of initiation is required, etc. But then again, he was writing in 1969. No one could independently verify what he had to say. And he was kind of, if you ask me, also going in for poetic license. He was trying to illustrate something. Again, I have a hard time reading past the guy's ego. I also have a hard time reading past his obvious misrepresentations. Um... I don't think that drinking and drugs are the way to knowledge of anything, although I suppose it's theoretically possible. Um, I, um, there's a lot that I object to in this, and I hope that it's got the right mixture of revulsion and fascination. Again, you're going to run into things like this when you deal with Tantra. This is just the extreme stuff. Uh, the extreme left-handed stuff. It gets even more extreme than this, if you want, but you know this is as far as I'm willing to go, or I feel like going in this series. Um, but you've got to remember, you go into the sort of gentrified elegance of a Western yoga class with a bunch of rather nice and clean-looking, leotard-wearing Western women. That's Tantra, too. <laughs> um, it's a massive mixture of basically everything, the entire universe, and our attempts to experience it physically. There are any number of ways to try and explore this, and I'm just sort of starting off with the shocking one that I disapprove of and don't like, but I understand the attraction. In other words, I'm, in a sense, I'm kind of just as leery of things that get a bit too weird as I denounced everybody for in my video, the previous video, um, where I said people just people's minds just shut off. In a sense, part of me shuts off when I read this packet this passage. But part of me gets some of it at least. 
and I don't think it's unhealthy um, to keep those two sort of things in balance. A healthy dose of, ooh, this is getting a little bit too weird for me, and a healthy dose of, I may be able to take this, I may be able to learn something from this. Um, and again, the biggest pratfall of all, and the, most, the thing that might disgust one the most, is simply the most obvious. It's all a bunch of mumbo jumbo from a certain um, angle. You know, if I were if I were in Hakim Bey's position and I was walking through the crowds of pilgrims, I would wonder what does this mean to these people? What do they get out of this? I would feel in some strange way that I would have to immunize myself from the general blind belief of so many of these people that would be around me. I would feel like I was a stranger, maybe in Mecca or something around swirling crowds of people waiting to kiss the Kaaba. That's how I would feel. I would sort of be fascinated by it all. But I would say, wow, these people take all this literally. They believe that there actually is a something called Kali up there and that chopping the heads off rams actually does something that makes her happy. It... It's a fine line. And again, they always warn you in Tantra and in Eastern philosophy in general. There's traps inside of traps, inside of snares, hiding behind apparent answers that are actually just bad left turns or whatever. Um, it's a massive subject, and it is one that is so easily misunderstood or uh, so easily, I guess... self-misrepresented, I guess. You look at it, and you almost want to not see what it might represent. Um, there are things in this life, per people like H.P. Lovecraft, that apparently we don't want to know. And by the time we find out about them, it's too late to go back. Um, that's why I say the old caution. If this starts to feel weird, if this starts to feel dangerous or likely to suck you into some place you don't want to go, heed that intuition. Don't run away blindly, but understand that a bit of skepticism is actually good for you, personally. Um, a little bit of revulsion, controlled revulsion. Don't allow your revulsion to control you, but when you do get revolted by something, understand why. Use your revulsion. Use your skepticism. Use the fact that you're turned off by certain things to your own advantage. Um, because, again, the entire thing is, in my opinion, to attempt to understand and perhaps interact with or even manipulate your own experiences. Um, I've often said that cogito ergo sum is about the only thing that I will take for granted, but I also, in my cosmology, experience is something that I say is as real as anything can get. And if you have that mindset and you say that experience is real or as real as anything, um, remember, when you have an experience, say, like Hakim Bey did, maybe he didn't actually interact with the goddess called Kali, but he did something, and it had an effect on him. Um, I think I know what effect that would have on me, but far be it for me, for me to tell someone else not to do this. Um, again, this is the extreme. This is the revulsion, which I think is, in a sense, as I say, healthy. Um, because if you read it the way I read it, overall, I get a negative vibe from that passage. But there's something in there. <laughs> More to follow.